Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. This is the third of the series of the webinar that we plan for this year on the topic of imagery and remote sensing for higher education community. For this webinar, we would like to bring the topic of deep learning analysis using ArcGIS. And we would like to take it from the angle of educators like you teaching this topic, how to start with a simpler workflow so it's easier to adopt in the curriculum and also easier to digest by the students as well. Before we start, a little bit of the housekeeping. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but feel free to enter your questions in the questions window at any time. We also have staff monitoring the questions, so they may answer your question in the chat directly. Some questions we will cover during the QA session. Now this session is also recorded and we will make the recording and slides available after. At the end of the webinar, we will launch an exit survey. Please do participate on the survey so we can help to improve our webinar. And it's also a good way for you to get connected with us at ASRI if you like, if you like to ask questions or request for assistance. One more thing. Before we continue, we would like to ask you a full question. Let's open the first full question. The question is, are you teaching imagery and remote sensing? Now, this is a multiple choices question, so feel free to check those that apply to you. Very nice. It seems that many of you have responded. Thank you so much. It seems like there is a majority of you teaching undergraduate, which is awesome. And also some of you are researchers. It's great. Thank you so much. Now I would like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar. We, the first presenter is Finay Wishwambaran. Finay is a principal product manager with ArcGIS Imagery product team. And second presenter is Sandeep Kumar. Sandeep is our senior product engineer for data science team at ASRI R&D Center in New Delhi. And myself, Kansrina Kurnia, I'm a senior solution engineer with education team at ASRI. I will mostly moderating the session and share the resources at the end. For the agenda, we will start with Fine that will give you a brief introduction to the deep learning for some of you that probably new to the technology. He also gonna show some application and a demo of end-to-end -end example. Then Sandeep will take over and cover the deep learning workflow in ArcGIS. He will start with uh, two options for you. The first one is a simpler works workflow using the pre pre-trained deep learning models that are already available in ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. Now, the second option is to train your own deep learning models, which you can do it if the, any of the pre-trained models doesn't work for you. Then Sandy will also go deeper into the deep learning concepts in detail. As much as we would like to demystify deep learning, it is pretty complex technology. So we still want you to understand the complexity of the deep learning analysis. And the more that you know that, the more you actually can, can tweak your model and can achieve the result that you want. Then Fine will take over to talk about the few best practices for applying deep learning analysis for teaching and research. And we will close uh, the webinar with QA session and resources. Now, before I hand it over to Fine, let's do another poll question. It's kind of like we need your, your interaction here. Um, the, this question is, we just want to know what is your level of comfort with the deep learning? Okay. So are you actually new to this, this deep learning, know very little or already getting familiar or you are uh, already implementing. Okay. So we can, we would like to gauge this. This is, this is, this is awesome. So 52% of you know very little. So with hopefully with this, then you can get a better uh, idea about the, the deep learning analysis. Okay. okay, we can close the pool result. And with that, 
Um, I gonna stop sharing and hand it over to Vinay that have a lot of the content to cover. Vinay, time is yours. Thank you, Rina, firstly. And I'm really excited to see you guys over here. Now, before I go on ahead, I'd like to talk to you about deep learning in general. Why is deep learning important? There's a fire hose of imagery and there's a ton of data that is streaming down the pipe daily. We've got huge amounts of satellites. There's massive amounts of drones that's capturing high resolution and high temporal data, which quickly becomes rather hard to manage. And it's not just about image management. It's not just about management of the data. You know, the traditional approach to take a couple images, extract features, that really doesn't scale anymore. Hence, we have deep learning, essentially teaching the machine to extract features for you. Now, the de facto solution for automation that we've seen historically for a long time is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Let's see how we can use AI and ML for automation purposes. Before proceeding, let's talk a little bit about what is deep learning. A lot of you have probably heard of artificial intelligence, machine learning. Deep learning is still relatively new to a lot of your users, our users, and hence obviously you are here. Now let's see how each one of these team terms, they fit together. Machine learning, it refers to data-driven approaches or algorithms where we learn from a lot of existing data and use that to predict the outcome for newer or unseen data. Deep learning is just one type of machine learning that is inspired by the human brain. Now, in the context of ArcGIS, all of you have been doing machine learning for a very long time. It's exposed in the form of simple tools to achieve a certain level of automation. And in many cases, reusability, even across different seasons, for instance. So clustering, image segmentation, space-time pattern manning, uh, mining, predictive analysis, these are all classic examples of machine learning. So we've seen machine learning, we've seen the tools and how long it's been around. Now a little bit of a background on how deep learning has evolved and how long has it been around. Computer vision is now almost as good, if not better than human vision at least in some of the imagery tasks. And at this point, I'd say most of the imagery tasks. This chart on the right, it shows you how the error rate at recognizing images in this ImageNet visual recognition competition has gone down every single year. Till 2012, machine learning was used and the error used or the error returned uh, was, was around 25%. Since then, deep learning took over and sometime, as you can see in the past few years, the error rate became so low that computers got better at recognizing images. They, got, they actually got better than humans. And they had to, because of this reason, discontinue the competition. We humans obviously can no longer judge a machine that's better than us in extracting features. Now, let's see how deep learning integrates within ArcGIS. There are more than 30 different models that are targeted towards specific tasks. And these tasks, they range from object detection to image classification to image enhancement, change detection, and much more. While they're mostly imagery related models, we also do have models that are non-spatial data, such as text and tabular data. And these are also available to our users directly from within ArcGIS. Additionally, ArcGIS also enables integration with third-party deep learning frameworks and machine learning libraries. Now, pictures speak a thousand words. So let me switch to a demonstration where we can go over the key applications of deep learning in ArcGIS and a demo that really showcases the value of deep learning within ArcGIS. Okay, so first, like I said, we have about 30 different deep learning models, right? So if I have to go over those 30 different models via demos, I'd probably take the entire presentation. So I decided to pull all of that into this story map. And this is a publicly available story map. You guys could take a look at it. I'll go through each one of the models that we have. So first one is object classification. 
this essentially, as you can see, there are different building structures in here, right? So I want to classify my structures in this case as either damaged or undamaged. And that exactly is what my deep learning model is doing here for me. Go on further down. This is the most common task. Everybody wants to detect objects from an image. You've got a collection of images. I want to detect the number of pools, the number of solar panels, the number of cars, planes. You use the object detection model to derive your own trained model for any given geography. Here's an example of how we've detected pools. Pixel classification, as the name suggests, it's used to classify your imagery into multiple th themes so that you get a thematic map a classified thematic map. Here we've used the uh, Sentinel image and then we've created a classified map using our pixel classification models. The, uh, the instant segmentation model, how is it different from object detection? Now, if I'd used object detection, ideally I would have gotten bounding boxes for each one of these buildings. With instant segmentation, it's actually delineating the actual geometry of each and every building. You see the difference, right? Edge detection, again, as the name suggests, it's used to detect edges. A typical use case is detecting field boundaries in the ag industry or detecting parcels. This is useful for urban planning and other scenarios. And then we have road extraction. Road extraction is massively requested, typically for urban planning, transportation planning, and much more. So uh, you can train your own road network uh, deep learning models based on your imagery and your geography. This is an interesting one, which is change detection. When you have a stack of images, what is the primary use case? You want to detect change. So here's this model, which will enable you to easily detect change. As you can see, we have two different images. And as I splice through them, you can see the number of images that have changed, the, the structures that have come across. Everything in pink is automatically detected by the system using the change detection model. This one is an interesting model wherein I've simulated optical imagery using radar data. So we've started from radar or SAR imagery and from there we've extracted optical imagery. Next is image captioning. Click on a given location and this is a self-constructed sentence which says it's detected a number of planes and it's detected this to be an airport and then it's constructed this to be um, the caption. It, it's constructed a caption that says you've detected multiple planes that are parked in this given airport. Lastly, image enhancement. This is almost like it's come out of the movies. This is what the image looked like previously, a 30, 30 centimeter resolution image. And as I scroll over, or as I swipe over my image, you can see this is a th synthetically derived image. So this is a high resolution image that has been derived from my low resolution image. So you can see there are a ton of models that we've made available within ArcGIS. And there are much more for point cloud data. There's for tabular data as well, like I just said, and there's for text as well. Now I'll just go over a demonstration showcasing the real value of deep learning. How can you do it with an ArcGIS and the real value of doing it within the context of a GIS. I'm not going to go over all of the tools. Sandeep will be doing a little bit of that. So firstly, to provide you with some context, this area of interest, this boundary that you see is really the fire perimeter of the Woolsey fires that took place late 2018. Now, my objective here is within the fire perimeter, you have about 10,000 bu buildings. Uh, the all of these little polygons in blue they are depicting buildings so i want to go through the process the deep learning process and then classify these building structures as damaged and undamaged and this is an exercise we did we put together with usaa which is an insurance company so they wanted to disseminate they wanted to distribute their insurance claims as soon as possible so it's obviously broken down into four multiple steps, the whole deep learning process. The first step is capturing training data. We provide you with a series of tools. You could either edit features and create your own training samples, or there are specifically designed tools to label your features for training purposes. So here you're essentially capturing training samples and you're telling the system, this is what a damaged structure looks like, and this is what an undamaged structure looks like. 
So you can pick a structure over here and you can add a new class, call this undamaged, give it a different color. So essentially you're telling the system, what does a damaged structure look like? What does an undamaged structure look like? You obviously need a ton of images or ton of uh, training samples to actually define these these uh, locations for your system. Uh, so in the interest, interest of time, I've created a bunch of pre-trained uh, samples and these are what my training samples look like. Zooming out, we've captured about 800 training samples right here. We've classified them manually as either damaged or undamaged structures. And then we go through a series of geoprocessing tools. It's available as part of the image analyst, analyst toolbox. In the deep learning tool set, you have access to tools to create those training chips from the training samples. Those chips are fed into the training, uh, train deep learning model, which will essentially train a model for you. And then we've got a series of tools here, which will do the inferencing, which will do the featured extraction for you. So after going through each one of these processes, this is what my result looks like. Those blue buildings that you saw at the start of the demonstration have now been classified as either damaged or undamaged. And zooming in a little tighter, you can see the results that I got. These automated results are actually better than that of a trained assessor. Now, like I said, the real value of doing deep learning within ArcGIS is it goes beyond just extracting features. Out of the box, you have access to more than these 1,400, 1,400 geoprocessing tools, right? All of this can be used for downstream analysis. So I use these features as barriers. I fed it into network analyst, and at that point, I've identified locations. I've tried to identify locations that are within 20 minute walk time for anybody who's been affected. So the best areas to plant shelters. So these are all of the affected buildings. Using network analyst, we derived or identified locations that are within 20 minute walk time for anybody who's affected. So that was simple analysis that we did, right? We just used a bunch of geoprocessing tools, feature analysis tools within ArcGIS and extracted those features. Next, I enriched those polygons and I brought it into this completely configurable operations dashboard. And for any given location, I can see the total number of damaged buildings, undamaged buildings, the average damaged building value, and the block population as well. As I pan around, you can see dynamically all of this prop pops up. And it's a completely configurable app, the operations dashboard. So you can do, you know, extract insights as much as you want, as 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 needed. All right, so in that demonstration, this was our workflow. We labeled our data, we trained the deep learning model, and then we ran inferencing. But at a high level, if you notice my complete demonstration, the real value, as you saw, was the entire ecosystem playing together. All of the imagery was managed by image server. We used a suite of tools to perform downstream analysis with the results and then used operations dashboards to translate those results into actionable insights through dashboards. A complete end-to-end -end geospatial deep learning system, right? And with that, I will hand it over to Sandeep, who will talk a little bit about how to get started with deep learning in ArcGIS, the tools, he'll talk about those tools in depth that I just talked about, the APIs, and much more. But before that, we have another poll question for you. And Rina, can you help out with that? Yes, thank you so much, Fine. You probably can uh, see the, you can move to the slide of the poll. So the question is, what is the primary data type would you like to run deep learning on? Okay. So there is a few. Um, answer in here. This is actually a single choice question. So choose the one that most uh, data type. 
that you would like to use in your deep learning analysis. Seems like 72% of you is actually use the satellite imagery and drone imagery. Awesome, very interesting. Okay. Thank you so much for your participation. Now uh, let's hand it over the session to Sandeep to continue. Yeah, thank you, Rina. So there are two options to get started with deep learning in ArcGIS. But we recommend you to start with the option one, especially in a classroom where time is a constraint. So the option one is to use pre-trained models. And then we have an option two to train your own models. So the pre-trained models are ready to use models which are as good as GUI tools and you can directly uh, deploy them on your imagery or any other data set. Second option, you can train your own models. But now let me just show you the next slide in which we can talk about first the pre-trained models. So Vinay might have shown you the whole workflow in which we label the data. We prepare a training data set in a format from which we can train a model and then we deploy the, mo the trained model. But the best way to introduce deep learning in your classrooms is pre-trained models. It's simple, it's ready to use and it reduces the imagery requirements for model training. It, re it reduces the labeling requirement. You don't need a massive compute uh, resources available with you to train those AI models. We can't make it any simpler. So let me just give you a tour of uh, the pre-trained models available on Living Atlas for Earth. So these are a few pre-trained models available on Living Atlas. The first one is Building Footprint Extraction USA. This works on high resolution imagery. Next, we have Building Footprint Extraction Africa. Next, we have road extraction for North America. Next, we have swimming pool detection. Next, we have a car detection model that works with drone imagery. Next, we have a solar panel detection model which works with drone imagery. Next, we have shipwreck detection model. It works with BEG data. Next, we have a ship detection model. It works with SAR data. So we also have a few models which are land cover classification model. The first one is land cover classification model that works with Sentinel-2 imagery. Next, we have land cover classification model that works with Landsat-8 imagery. Next, we have a human settlements model that works with Landsat-8 imagery. Next, we have a human settlements model which works with Sentinel-2 imagery. Now, apart from these imagery models, we also have models for point cloud classification. The first one here is the power line and tree point detection. Using this model, you can detect infrastructure lines and electric poles. Next, we also have a model for image reaction, such as this one, face and license plate blurring. Also, we have object tracking models. These models you can use with full motion video support in ArcGIS Pro and detect moving objects in a video like this one. So this were, this is, uh, so we have seen what? Now let's see why it is so important. For example, if you have a large imagery, you want to create information layers out of it. You can use pre-trained models to directly create a GIS from it. Here I have loaded imagery for Grenada. Grenada receives 78, Im uh, 78 inches of rainfall annually. Due to that, some buildings and other infrastructure is constantly at risk of damage due to flooding. So now, this is how the flood susceptibility looks like. We will now try to use pre-trained models to extract buildings and roads. The first tool which we'll be using to extract the building footprints from this so now we'll use the detect objects using deep learning tool. And we can see we we can see all these models on the living atlas. So these are all the models available in the living atlas. 
So the for the first one, we'll extract building footprints. In the interest of time, I already ran the tool. I'll zoom in to the city of St. George. It has the model has already detect, detected around 50,000 buildings. Out of that, these 1,500 buildings, which are falling in flood-prone areas. We then also extracted roads. And then we combine these layers along with the LIDAR data to create a digital twin out of it. Here we can see these all layers combined at a single location. And along with that, we can also we have also extracted the power lines and poles using the pre-trained model for that. This digital twin can now also be used for urban planning disaster management and prevention, and many other use cases. This is the power of automation. And we try to make it very simple for you. You can also use these pre-trained models to start adopting deep learning in your classrooms. So this was about pre-trained models. Sorry to pre interrupt, models. Sandeep. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, Sandeep. But folks, as you've seen this demo, I have already seen this demo a couple of times. It always blows my mind. His input was a massive collection of imagery. It was just imagery using that you and using those pre-trained models. He was able to create a full blown foundational GIS. This enabled him to derive valuable insights in a matter of minutes. It just completely blows my mind. Imagery pre-trained models put them together valuable insights. Back to you Sandeep. I was just excited about that. I just had to express that. Thank you Vinay. So this was about pretend models. Pretend models really give you a jump start. But now there are several scenarios too where you need to train your own models. Specific to your geography, specific to your imagery properties, or you are just looking for a different asset for which we don't provide a pretend model. For that, you can use the complete workflow and we got you covered with all the required tools in ArcGIS. You can do an end-to-end -end workflow. You can design models for your specific geography, resolution, imagery properties, and if a specific asset you are looking for. Now, to train your own models, you can take two routes. The output of both is same, but it depends on your preference to use a GUI tool or an API script. Even in your classroom, you might have seen some students that want to use GUI tools, while some prefer API over that. The best part here is these two are com completely interoperable and deliver identical results. Combine this and that you can use any portion from both of these routes. So now we'll see. So now we'll see a workflow where I'll combine both these routes to complete an end to end workflow. Here in ArcGIS Pro, I have loaded a land cover layer on top of a high resolution imagery. This land cover layer is from Chesapeake Conservancy, dated 2013 to 14. We downloaded a specific portion of this land cover for Kent County. Once loaded to ArcGIS Pro, we can see this is how our training imagery looks like, and this is how our land cover looks like. The first tool which I'll going which I'll use is export training data for deep learning. I'll export my land cover along with imagery to a format that can be used to train deep learning models. And here it is. These are the images in form of small chips or tiles. These are labels corresponding to those images. Now I'll bring them back, load them in ArcGIS Pro to train a deep learning model. The tool which I can use here is a trained deep learning model tool. I have filled all these parameters, but I really want to use as a data scientist. I always prefer a notebook over a tool to train my deep learning models. So now I load in the training data to my notebook here in ArcGIS Pro itself using ArcGIS Pro notebooks. So once I load my training data, I can use the prepare data function to load it. I can pass in the path where I have stored my data. And once it's loaded, I can use the data.show batch method to visualize 
a few samples of my training data. This is how it looks like. The land cover is overlaid on top of imagery. Once we have loaded our data, we can create a model. The model is a pixel classification model. Once I've created a model, I have not trained it yet. So let's see how it works without training. I can use the model.show results method. And because we have not trained it, we can see it compares. It does not even compare with the ground truth because it it's it, it's not understanding what it has to do right now. But now we can continue training this model. To do that, we can use model.fit method. You can ignore this parameter because we have covered you in defaults. So you can just call model.fit if you don't understand this parameters right now. So on the left side, you'll see epoch written. That means my model has seen the training data four times right now. And you can see a accuracy column. So we can see uh, as the model sees the data again and again, it's able to understand the data, the relation between the imagery and the land cover. And the accuracy keeps on improving. For now, we'll just train it for 10 epochs and we'll check in 10 epochs how good is it working. It's less than under half a minute. So we can check the results and we can see that the model is starting to understand the relation between the imagery and the land cover. But to get a good model, we need to train it further. So once we train it further, we'll get some good accuracy number. And if we check the results now, it compares very well to the ground truth. Our model is able to understand even the finer details. Once trained, we can save this model using the model.save method and then load it back in this tool. This tool is classified pixels using deep learning tool. We can pass in testing imagery that is different from our training area. And once we, we run this model, right now I'm limiting it to a testing extent. And yes, I have a GPU, so I'll also specify a GPU here. So once I run it, I'll compare it with the ground truth. So this is how my ground truth looks like. It's from 2013, imagery from different times. So you can see some of the buildings are missing on the left side, but this is the output of our model. And we can see these buildings are there. So this is the power of automation, which I was talking about, but with your own training data, your own custom models. So you can do that using tools within ArcGIS Pro itself. So now we saw ArcGIS Pro and we also saw, saw a part of API. And let's just see how it compares with the underlying APIs which are used in the uh, in the AP, in ArcGIS API, but with an increased level of abstraction and tight coupling with large scale deep learning models. So you can see the code on the left side, PyTorch code on the right side, you can see ArcGIS.learn code. This is the API. You can do, you can simply train a model in six lines. You don't need to write much code. It's just a very simple and consistent API. So now we saw that we use pre-trained models. We also saw a workflow in which we created our own models. We first recommend you to try the first option in your classrooms due to the time constraints. And also you can try your own models also. You can definitely try the option two if you feel that you are not being covered by the option one anytime. To take any of those options, I'd like to share with you one more thing about the installation of deep learning libraries. To start in ArcGIS Pro, you need to install the deep learning libraries installer that's available on a GitHub repo and we have the links for that. You can directly install, take it from there and install it. Then we have ArcGIS Learn Corner Meta Package if you are an Anaconda user. We also have some other resources for disconnected users. So now I'll talk about 
deep learning concepts in a little bit detail. So everything was fun so far, but deep learning at a conceptual level can get complex to explain. This section might get a little overwhelming, but it is just a set of concepts which we think is very important for you as educators to understand. So the first thing which I want to talk to you about is what's the training validate training set and the validation set. We have seen this graph. We have seen this type of table printed on our API previously. So what was training and validation? It's nothing but uh, we key, we hold back some amount of training data just to check whether our model is performing as well as on a new data compared to what it has seen already on which it has been trained. So you can also hold back some data for a later when you get a pre-trained model just to verify that your model works on unseen data as good as on the training data. So now you can control the split between validation and training set using the parameter in the API or using this validation field in the GUI tool. Next, I wanted to show you this image. Yeah, this is the same image which is transformed in many way to look like a different image. So even if you, if you have less training data, you can train very good models using data transformations. This is by default on and you don't need to do anything else to do it, but just want to give you some information that this is being used and due to this, the models perform really well in real world scenarios. It reduces underfitting or overfitting. Just give you an appropriate fitting, even if you are using a pretty small data set or a pretty large data set. You can control, you can also control this if you want using the transforms parameter in the API. Next is about a learning rate finder. So when we are training these deep learning models, they look at our data multiple times. If they and with each pass, they understand some relation between, let's say, for example, imagery and land cover. But the level, the level of understanding per pass has to be controlled so that you can train a robust model, but in a given time. So we provide you with tools such as the learning rate finder so that you can easily find an appropriate learning rate. And also it's by default on in the API as well as the GUI tools. So you need not worry about it, but yes, you can control it if you want to control it. This is an important hyperparameter and technically it's not required, but you can also, but you can control it when required. So just to give you an overview of what we saw, like a model training, saving and loading cycle. So once you have your data, you can create a model, you can fit it, you can save it and deploy it on a testing AI. But let's say if you want to come back, train your model further on a new data, or you want to train it further on the same data, you can do it using the model.load method and you can fit it again for, for more steps or more epochs. So now I'll hand it over to Vinay will give you some information about few best practices. Over to you, Vinay. Thank you. That was a lot of information. So the concepts, they might have been overwhelming for some of you, but again, as Sandeep said, we think it's important for you to know especially for you as educators, you need to know these concepts, understand these concepts better. Now that we've gone over everything deep learning, we've demystified it for you. Let's talk best practices. The number one factor that determines the accuracy and quality of your deep learning model is really the quality of your training samples. So what encompasses preparing that ideal training set? You've got to be selective. There needs to be a balance of classes, reduce the over-represented classes as well. 
if you just want to detect structures and pawns like here on the right capture them accurately and as two separate features but if you want to detect this as a single k first site as a whole label them together with that context included now try to apply image augmentation to oversample underrepresented classes uh, it's a parameter both in the api and the tool as well then uh, next is the size of the chips which is a constant question i get it should be i'd say over than or equal to 400 pixels now these larger chip sizes why do we recommend them these chip sizes they provide better context to your model lastly the universal question how many image chips do i need usually somewhere between 400 and 40000 is what i recommend i know the range is really really huge but it really depends on your use case if we need a generic model that is applicable on a wide geography we need training data that represents that variety and that geography but if we apply the model to a limited area or a limited geography we can get relatively good results with limited training data now we've trained a model right how do i know that my model is good without really having to run it over my entire project area try to run inferencing over multiple regions with large variability and when i say variability i mean variability in terms of context or number of positive examples obviously the best way to tell or judge the results is to perform a visual scan over your entire inference results make sure these results are over a test area an area that the training data has not seen as yet it's an area that doesn't contain any of the training data basically once done training the model we provide you with a model metrics file if you look into the folder you see a model metrics file i have a screenshot over here on the right look at the training metrics it provides you with a confusion matrix uh, validation accuracy both of which are good indicators of the model quality you can avoid you know uh, standardized indicators like the map and f1 score these indicators are useful when training happens over a known benchmark so they don't really tell you how well a model will perform in practice once you've saved your model look for this graph as well it's available in the model metrics.html file the graph trend will tell you which which category your model falls in the model graph on the left for instance it indicates model is not complex enough so try to increase the backbone size the graph in the center both trains and validation training and validation losses are decreasing but have not yet converged obviously this means you need to keep training your deep learning model last graph is the model has overfit implement early early stopping in this case reduce the number of epochs or let the system automatically stop it when it is no longer improving again this is a flag that's available in your tool which is it's enabled by default and it's available as part of the api as well the curves on the left represents ideal model behavior but it also indicates the model converged a while ago so you're wasting time and resources so implementing early stopping would be good the graph on the right shows the loss oscillating wildly. Here's where you try a smaller learning rate. Another question you will run a lot into is what imagery do I need? What hardware do I need, right? Confirm, confirm your imagery is suitable. Again, deep learning is not magic. Can the object of interest be identified? Be, can, can it be identified be, uh, by you as a human? If you can identify it within a couple seconds, the machine can do it for you automatically. Ensure the resolution, bands, and bit depth match the model requirements. Something to keep in mind for your analysis is that 8-bit and 3-band imagery is no longer a limitation. So you have multiple bands, something like the Landsat data, the NAEP imagery, or MaxR imagery, you can use all of those bands together. So deep learning accounts for higher bit depths and additional multispectral bands. Training deep learning models, they have huge compute requirements. So we typically recommend training and inferencing to be done using GPUs. A good desktop GPU would be something in the range of the RTX 2, uh, 2000 ranges or the RTX 3000 or uh, P4000 or the GV100 series. 
as for cloud gpus t4 v100 aws instances the entire g4 or p3 instance series you could have a look at that azure instances the nd6s they're good instances which you should consider looking at and with that we're nearing the end of our presentation the key takeaways from our session today arcgis has powerful deep learning capabilities powerful tools and apis to enable you to breeze through your deep learning workflows these tools are accessible through a variety of clients a lot of this was shown to you today by sandeep we support a range of tasks all the way from image classification to object detection to change detection and much more if you remember the first story map that's where we showed you a lot of these tasks that was supported natively by arcgis the processing is massively scalable so you can use arcgis enterprise to scale out your processing now to complement our deep learning solutions we have a powerful image management solution and over 1400 geoprocessing tools as i mentioned before as well to perform downstream analysis on your results lastly we're further democratizing ai and we're making deep learning accessible to the larger geospatial community by providing pre-trained deep learning models, right? And with that, let me hand it over to Rina, who will cover resources, and she will be fielding questions as well. Thank you, Svine. So we are in the QA session. Thank you so much for um, many of you that are uh, posting your questions. I would like to cover the questions related to the resources first. Okay? Um, uh, one of you asked if we, you, we are, is it permitted to use the webinar recording to engage uh, your students? The answer is, is yes. We gonna, so after this webinar, we're going to send you the link to the uh, recording and also the link to the slide deck. Feel free if you want to use it in your classroom. So um, I can send you an email to each of you a week after the, the webinar, listing again all these uh, resources, story map, recording, and everything, and you can use it for your class or for teaching or research. And one of you asking question as well, that can we get the demo white paper step-by-step step and where the data is found? So for that, we're actually working with the Learn team learn ArcGIS team that they actually uh, created lessons um, for the deep learning that you can use in the class that will include step-by-step -step instruction and also the data and a couple of them is excitingly is in the pipeline is about that um, the fire destruction model and also the mangrove it, that's in the in, in the making and we i will keep you posted okay um all right so all that resources you can use it for teaching and research and i will again i will send you all after this webinar is about a week from now and you can always engage with us and ask more uh, after the webinar all right so there is a question in here that i will send it to um sandeep is is a, is there a specific deep learning model that applicable for any environment worldwide I think you mentioned it a little bit, right, Sandeep? So the question is, any deep learning model that is applicable? To any environment worldwide? To any environment world. worldwide. Yeah. yeah, so most of our uh, deep learning models are trained on uh, training data from specific geography. But we have seen that they work well even on other parts from which we have there, they have not been trained. Additionally, we have tested the ship detection model, the shipwrecks detection model, and the land cover model, the roads model. They work fairly well across uh, the whole world. It's subjective awesome. to your imagery properties and also very specific to the geography you apply it on. It may or not may may not uh, work really well at each location 
I see. So many of them is actually, we put it in the story map. If you see some of the area is for worldwide, will we'll work. Some of them, we, we, we kind of like put a note like North America, but give it a try and see if it's working in, in, in the area of your interest. Okay. All right, thank you, Sandeep, for that. And I think uh, this next question, I'm gonna send it to Fine. So Fine, you give the demo of the fire destruction model. Um, that fire destruction model has no step for validation. Is it really that easy and trustworthy? What if the training samples aren't that good? No, so we do, I, I think later on, I did mention uh, in the best practices, there was a section where we say, in addition to the model, we provide you a collection of files, one saying the model metrics. And in the model metrics, we show you screenshots of what the ground truth looks like and what the predicted result looks like. So when you're training your model, you can specify keep aside 10% just for validation purposes or 20% just for validation purposes. And then we provide you with a confusion matrix and we provide you with a bunch of scores which will enable you to decide uh, uh, which will enable to enable you to look at the accuracy of the deep learning model and even the detected features once you run inferencing there is a confidence that is associated with each feature that is extracted so every step of the way there is a certain amount of validation that we're doing awesome thank you Fine. So the next question here is, how can I split training, testing, and validation data in ArcGIS deep learning tools? Yes, in ArcGIS Pro. It automatically does it for you. So as part of the tools, one of the parameters is the validation test. Uh, and there you specify, this is kind of related to the previous uh, question. You can specify set aside 10% or set, set aside 20% and auto automatically the system decides for you. It'll take out, for example, if you've captured 10, 100 training samples and say set aside 10, uh, 10%, 90 of those training samples will be used to train your model and 10 of them will be used for validation purposes. Thank you. And uh, Sandeep, if you want to chime in anytime at all, feel free to jump in. Yeah, that 10% uh, is by default. So even if you don't specify anything, it will keep 10% aside for validation. Thank you. Um, related to that probably is like, we working with the train models, with S3 train models. The question is, can I use externally trained model for inferencing in ArcGIS Pro? There, uh, there is a deep learning framework and uh, we can provide you a link to that and you can bring in your own chain models, but you need to do some extra work to glue that to that particular deep learning framework. I see. Okay. So the I, any of you that answer that, uh, uh, ask that question, feel free in the survey to indicate if you want us to contact you after this. So we talk about uh, best practices, sample site, GPU, and everything. So there's one question in here. Uh, we have access to high-performance computing cluster. However, the OS is Linux. Can I run deep learning tools in that environment? Uh, so you're asking about running deep learning tools within Linux. Yes. Yeah, if it's... If it's enterprise, yes, but ArcGIS Pro is obviously not designed on uh, Linux. Um, the the so, Python one can, I guess, when you run it as the Python notebook. So um, that would be yes. correct, right, Sandeep? Yes, yes, yes. You can use uh, the Python API in your Linux environment. We provide with uh, ArcGIS underscore learn meta package. You can get it from the S3 channel and uh, your environment will be ready. Very well, thank you. Um, okay, there is a few other questions in here that I we didn't have time to answer, but again, indicate it in your uh, exit survey if you want to be contacted with us and we would more than happy to answer your questions one-to-one. 
Okay. But with that, I will uh, share the resources. So this is a list of resources, and I believe we're gonna also put a uh, copy and paste this one in the chat. So the first one is the installer, deep learning libraries installer from GitHub when you want to use it in ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Server as well. Some sample notebooks, Asterisk community in ArcGIS Pro or in uh, a Python API that will help you with some uh, question as well. We have the GitHub repo for ArcGIS API for uh, Python and some link to the resources for GeoAI and also um, the deep learning models. I, the last one, it was my blog for that. Um, and again, I would like to illustrate that, uh, to say again that a week from now, you're gonna get email from me that more comprehensive list of the resources, including the um, learn lessons that you can use in your classroom and the recording as well. All right, with that, I would like to thank you all of you for attending this webinar. Uh, please stay tuned for the last webinar series, which is in December, will be about the topic of image management. I know many of you have a massive imagery collection. We really appreciate all your participation on this webinar. Please, please take part in the exit survey. And if you want to get in touch with us, feel free to contact me. I write my email here on my slide. Um, so uh, thank you again. And thank you for uh, Fine and Sandy for presenting. And have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody, for attending. We really appreciate you attending. And feel free to reach out to us for any question that you have.